Our last panel is going to focus on place. This is a discussion on how places and spaces shape our communities and how there is a need to reimagine retail, mixed use, and other land use opportunities. What will future cities and communities look like and how can we ensure the highest and best use of our existing areas? We're going to be moderated by Dr. Wallace Walrod, Chief Economic Advisor with the Orange County Business Council and a number of wonderful panelists. Over to you, Dr. Walrod. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Wallace Walrod. I'm from Tech Coast Consulting Group. It's my great privilege and pleasure to moderate this panel on place with a focus on the future. Some questions we'll ask uh, during this session will include how communities uh, can reimagine retail, mixed use, and other land use. What, what about the future of our cities and communities? What is that going to look like? And how can we ensure the highest and best use of our existing areas? I think a key idea from the outset is um, this is all about finding the right place to do the right thing. Now, let me introduce our panelists. First, my good friend, uh, Shaheen Sadegi. I think if anyone has cracked the code on creating unique, vibrant places, it is Shaheen. He's the founder, president, and CEO of Lab Holdings. And in a previous life, he had a very su su successful career in the fashion industry, including he was at Gotcha Sportswear and Quicksilver. Next, uh, Ryan Cortez. He's economic development coordinator with the city of Corona. Uh, Ryan has put his focus recently on the disposition and development of city-owned property within Corona's downtown district. And finally, Rob Matthews. He's a principal at Housiel Levine Associates with more than 20 years of expertise driving technological innovation in the planning space. So let's dive right in. Um, uh, first of all, I want to have a, a discussion with the group and then we're going to turn it over to individual questions. So. Let's start out, what are the characteristics a community must have in order to foster sustainable and efficient new development? Uh, maybe Ryan, please uh, kick it off. Uh, Thank you, Wallace, I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, first and foremost, the first thing um, is having a sense of community. So we're out here in Riverside County, multiple communities, um, but uh, it's hard to develop a project with any sense of, uh, of community if you just don't know you don't understand and you don't understand the culture that you're developing in. Sure, you could go and build a neighborhood center, um, be just like any other neighborhood center, and, and we seem to have one on every corner, but if you're truly trying to develop a project with unique characteristics, something like Shaheen does, you need to go in there, you need to invest in the community, you need to understand them, do your due diligence and find out what they're asking for, what the city's asking for, and how you're gonna make that a unique quality project um, that's sustainable. Uh, as we know, uh, the next generation, they want, we want to be able to touch and feel and um, the retail environment is changing so much and um, we need to, uh, need to better understand what those what that next generation really truly is after and I think as you as you alluded to nobody's done this better than Shaheen I'm super excited to have the opportunity to work with him and really got to visit not only his projects but similar projects and understand what that what that means and how to rethink planning um, ultimately you know Oftentimes cities develop their general plans and specific plans and they do this, but by the time the project actually comes forward, it might be 10, 15, 20 years down the road and things have changed so much. So it's about pushing the envelope, understanding and being adaptable to, um, to the changing environment. If you don't, um, you know, retail is not static. And if cities continue to, uh, to, to go down that road of, it's not in the book, it's on the plan, um, you'll, uh, you'll end up with a lot of development that, uh, 10 years, it's, it's, uh, it, you run into problems, you run into vacancy problems, and the community goes elsewhere. Thank you, Ryan. I think that's a perfect segue. Shaheen, thoughts on this? Yeah, well, I think um, Ryan said it well, honestly. It's, uh, I think community seems to rise. And, you know, look, we're in really interesting time. Um, I'm actually excited about what's going on. <laughs> and not to say that there's a lot of people hurting, including <laughs> ourselves, you know, we all got affected by this. But um, I think that, you know, culturally we've sort of come to this place where we are definitely more localization as opposed to homogenization. You know, I think most of you know that, you know, really after World War II, um, we as a country became very homogenized. Our food was homogenized, our 
development of housing was homogenized, cookie cutter approach. Uh, everything was formula based, including our automobiles and all the other uh, goods and services that we subscribe to. And I think really what's happened, you know, comes here 60 years later. Um, I'm finding a lot, much more attraction to localization. Uh, and it goes through the entire fabric of, of, of our communities, whether it's, you know, all of a sudden farmer markets are, are back everywhere around the country. And, you know, when we travel from one spot to another, we really want to try local things. You know, I, you know, I, I jokingly say, you know, if I go to Austin, Texas, I don't, I want to go have some <laughs> local badass barbecue. I don't want to go eat at Denny's or at, at Cheesecake Factory, you know? So I think, um, Really, the, the idea is that each community, each neighborhood today, I think, has its own culture. Um, Corona is a great example. Um, we have an underlying theory that we use that everybody's cool today. And if you don't think you're cool, you can just go Google it and you'll become cool. <laughs> and so so it's, it's, uh, we all want the same thing. I, I, I think, honestly, the biggest thing that I see, at least, you know, the direction that we're headed with our organization is, I'm just seeing all the walls come down. There's no development walls in the sense of this is retail and this is office and this is where you live um, and this is where you go for entertainment. I think all of these things in some ways are coming together. I also really mean it when I say that everybody's cool. I think we all want the same thing. So this isn't the, the projects of the past were about this is for rich people, or this is for poor people, or this is for Hispanics, and this is for white people. I think all of those barriers have gone away. Again, we all want the same thing. Everybody wants great local food. Everybody wants a local brewery. Um, and so it's a matter, you know, our role in our organization is just being able to take these local products into the local communities and find those local crafters, which is, you know, what we call micro manufacturers are taking over sort of the mass manufacturers in a sense and find these micro manufacturers in each community and, and sort of develop the, develop the proper area for them. Great. Thank you, Shaheen. Rob, what's your perspective on this? Yeah. Well, uh, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, as a planner, I can speak to the physical aspects of the built environment uh, for sure, especially around sustainability. Um, we know that urban form affects every aspect of human behavior, how much energy we use, how much we drive, and uh, how our daily patterns of doing our everyday tasks like shopping, going to work, et cetera, or school, how those all play out. And so there, we also know that there are numerous benefits of higher density mixed use development, which plays into also creating the kinds of experiences that uh, we've just heard a minute ago. So environmentally, um, we know that there can be a substantial uh, reduction in transportation energy, which is obvious when we live in a more compact fashion and live closer to things. But it's also uh, buildings that share walls, even townhouses have a lower environmental footprint as well. And this really adds up. Um, it can also have a direct tie to uh, the VMT reductions the state is mandating to lower greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. And so from a, a sustainability standpoint, um, compact development is definitely an important uh, tool in the toolkit. Um, but there's also a, a, a social sustainability aspect of this. Uh, it's definitely easier to form a sense of community when people have face-to-face -face, uh, encounters with their neighbors, when they come together as humans and, and we crave this social interaction. Um, and in, in, in a very real way, I think that uh, is what binds our society together. So having places for people to come and interact with one another and find that authenticity of place is something that people, I, uh, I think, really, really crave overall. So I guess I would just say that it's great that um, mixed use and higher density development has all of these benefits. Um, but the really good news is that there's tremendous demand for this. Um, we see it all across uh, the United States. People want places that are pedestrian oriented, they, they don't know, I think very few people would ever say they want to be in a mixed use area, but there's an inherent understanding of what that feels like. So uh, I would just say overall, I think that um, the, the development patterns are really important and it plays uh, directly into how we envision uh, these retail and office and places where we live. Thanks, Rob. Let's move the discussion to a discussion about what's unique um, 
at this time about the Inland Empire and what do you think the future of sort of smart growth and development are uh, in the region? Um, so I, whoever wants to, to kick that off. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick off also. Right. So I've been a big proponent. I, right now we're at a critical time in the Inland Empire. Um, we still have available land to develop, not, not necessarily here in Corona. As in Corona, a little bit of a built-out city as are some of our surrounding neighboring cities, but as a whole, as a region, we're at a really critical time. I've been a big proponent of continuing to push job growth um, in order to build a sustainable community, develop sustainable projects. Uh, we need to continue to push job growth. And there's been a lot of discussion on, I sit down with the uh, planners and economic developers across the region, uh, not only in Merced County, but San Bernardino County, and a lot of communities now are, you know, oh, we're a bedroom community, we're just going to build more master plan residential communities. And, and I pushed back and said, no, we need to, we need to really think about not only commercial and retail development, but how are we going to land the job so that we can give our residents a lifestyle. Um, spending three or four hours on the freeway every day, which is realistic for some of the people out here and folks out here who are coming into the Los Angeles or Orange County job markets, um, it, that's, that's not a sustainable life, lifestyle. And last thing those folks want to do when they get home is, is go out and enjoy their community and ends up becoming a bedroom community. So how do we change that narrative? How do we share that the labor force is out here? And, and really it becomes a marketing um, play around it. Um, so we're, uh, we're hard at work at that. Uh, still still uh, making the effort and pushing that narrative and trying to change that. Um, but uh, right now I really truly feel that we're at a critical time and that the rest of the region um, needs to put a put a focus on creating sustainable jobs. Thank you, Rob or Shane. Uh, I can jump in on this. Uh, so again, I think this sort of takes me back to the point of you know looking at all of these situations without any walls. And you know we we have all these artificial walls historically that we put. You know these are people that live in Corona are 909ers and people that live in Orange County are 4949ers. And, you know, we have all these ways of segmenting, but, you know, there are lots of cool people, well-educated and great craft people that live in Corona just because they don't want to spend $10 million to live in Newport beach or, or on a coastal. And again, they want the same products, they want the same services. And I think the part that I'm a bit disappointed about is the fact that, you know, I still look at it as precious land and precious, particularly the areas that are that are historic. You know, I think there's parts of Corona that really uh, sort of excited us because it's, I kind of like it because it's, you know, nothing has happened there for so long. I just look at it, this just amazing opportunity of bringing some of that culture back, you know? You know, the challenge is, you know, if you really think about it from a human scale and not necessarily in terms of a developer, you know, the reality is when I go home in the evening, if I lived in Corona, like the last thing I want to do on a Friday night is uh, put the, bring, take the family back in the truck and get back on the, on the 91 freeway and then get on the 55 or the 57 and then get on the 5 and the 405 and the 73 to go down to a beach community to get something to eat. And the reality is maybe once in a while, but people want to do things in their own neighborhood. So I, I really think that the people in the Inland Empire are there, but I am really frustrated with the level of products and the integrity of uh, product in terms of let's say even residential, you know? Um, so I really think it's time for for somebody to show up and deliver some really great goods uh, that the community deserves, you know? And I always say there's culture everywhere. If we just scratch the surface a little bit, you know, I think we all have to be a little bit of an archeologist these days, you know, to find out. And, and I know when I tapped into the history of uh, Corona, I mean, I, there's just so much there, you know? And I know that that exists in whether you're in Riverside County or, um, it, it, any, anywhere in Riverside County, I should say. So um, I, I think the whole thing equates to opportunity in, in, in my eyes, it really does. Thank you. I, that's a perfect term for you, Shaheen. I think present day urban archeologist like fits. So <laughs> <laughs> we got to develop that moniker. Um, Rob, what do you think? You've spent some time in the Inland Empire. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say that uh, looking at available land and space, we, we need to 
do exactly what was said and look for those opportunities. I've seen a lot of interesting ways in which large fields of parking surrounding retail centers um, have been transformed into dynamic mixed use areas. That's just one example. Uh, this also happens for office parks as well. For example, here in Pasadena, there's a major new development springing up around the Parsons headquarters building. Um, and uh, there's additional critical mass um, that can be brought into these areas to make them successful. And I think the key is to find the synergies, to, to see the opportunity of what's available in the land or the infrastructure, and then find those synergies and bring them together, uh, whether that's a, a, a green field or a gray field location, uh, but realizing that the old uh, distributed or, or separated or often called Euclidean zoning of the past where all of the uses were very strictly separated from one another isn't really the way cities were built throughout most of history. And it's not really what we respond to best as humans. So I think taking a fresh look at that and um, maybe also part to follow on to that archaeology uh, metaphor is to really look to the past and see how the places that we love, for example, when we go on vacation, um, when the places that we respond to, what those look like, and how do we bring some of that energy and excitement into where we live in our own communities? That's great, thanks, thanks Rob. We're now gonna to move to sort of individual questions for individual panelists. I'm gonna kick it off with you, Shaheen, if that's okay. So when it comes to you choosing the next place for your next development, what do you consider to be the most important factors? Well, I think um, it's an interesting question, Wallace. Um, look, we are convinced that um, crafters um, and micro manufacturing in America is the next wave. You know, I, I actually think there's a revolution going on. And, and to give you an example, you know, I think, as you know, because uh, we've done some work together, you know, I think the entire country is asking itself, what does retail look like? Absolutely. And, you know, what do we do? And, and it's obviously it's going through this complete transformation. And I would sit here today, even with the current uh, COVID-19 situation that we're all dealing with, and I would say that this probably has been some of the best retail environment that that I remember in history. And, you know, I was president of Quicksilver, so we've, you know, we've been involved on a national and international basis in terms of retail and manufacturing. This is the best I've seen it because there are so many young entrepreneurial and Americans that are now starting new businesses. And, you know, as you know, my company is called The Lab, stands for Little American Businesses which is, you know, with 30 years in business now. So 30 years ago, I honestly believe in that. Today, I think it's even more relevant. And so when I think about these situations is I think affordability becomes a big part of the equation because, you know, I can, you know, I can go out and build the most beautiful retail environment. You know, we, we, we do enough research and we, we've done enough traveling. We get it. But I can't be in a position where I'm charging, you know, a high-end mall pricing for 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 my users because my users are mom and pops for the most part, and they're looking for affordability. But that doesn't mean they're not cool. They're still expecting a lot. I mean, this is a, you know, this is a very interesting um, uh, consumer base that we're dealing with. It's a fairly sophisticated, it's much different than again, where we came from, where we're all into just fast food. And, you know, we, we were happy as society with mediocrity. And I think today, you know, the social aspect of, of products and, you know, where does it come from and who's making this stuff and what's the maker. And, you know, I jokingly say, you know, we used to sell a hamburger today, you know, customer walks in and asks, well, is the meat, local and is it organic fed you say yes it is and then is the tomato organic yes it is and is the bun gluten-free yes it is okay i want to meet the chef and you know okay so you go to the back and bring the chef and they say well what's your philosophy and they, they want to have the conversation and you know this is a whole different customer than going through a mcdonald's drive through and having somebody chuck a you know a uh, big mac at you you know, and, and you eat it in your car. And so I think it's a whole different mentality. And, and that's the, so the, both the producer, meaning the, the operator really has to have a passion and the consumer only wants to spend money 
on things that are important to them as opposed to just general commodity. And I can say the same thing about all other industries. You know, again, I jokingly, you know, repeatedly said, you know, like my generation drinks beer or drank beer and this generation wants to know how to make beer before they, they give you the order. They want to have a conversation with the brewmaster. This is different than walking through a, you know, a grocery store and grabbing a 12 pack of uh, Budweiser, you know, it's a whole different. So I think we're looking at where can we produce this product at a reasonable price and where can we go where uh, these products, a lot of the local, you know, I call them localization, I call it localization, personalization, customization, as opposed to homogenization. And where can we go where there is the where, the, where there are these crafters, uh, the local micro manufacturers that we can build a home to. That's great. And and again, I don't look at it in terms of retail or manufacturing. As a matter of fact, you know, we're working on a project down in San Marcos, and it's really called reindustrial, which is, you know, I think the next wave is industrial space turns into retail because, again, as I say, all the walls are down from all of these category. Uh, that we've set up over the years. So I think people want to manufacture and sell their goods at the same spot. So you don't manufacture here and then you go rent a sort of a high-end mall space just to sell your goods. And why can't you do it in the same place? As a matter of fact, many people like to see the manufacturing process. Uh, it's entertainment. You know, I want to see the maker. I want to see how this stuff is made and I want to, I want to consume it there. You know, I think breweries are a good example of that. You know? Absolutely. Thank you, Shaheen. That's that's great. Um, Ryan, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, in your work at City of Corona, how have you strategized to create a sense of place that residents, businesses, and visitors want to visit? Thank you, Wallace. Yeah, um, as a city, I, I think we've uh, overall we're a city of history. Um, we're 120 plus years old, and um, there's a lot of a lot of deep roots here. There's also a lot of families here that have been here a long time. Um, and we worked hard to continue to just adapt to the, the trends while keeping our history. Um, it's really, a, it's a never ending effort. So, um, you know, what we strategized 15, 20 years ago, if, if we kept on that, uh, it would be, we'd be out of day as I shared prior. Um, so we've, uh, we've master planned our communities, but at the same time as we start to do sort of phase two of, of our downtown and other areas of town, um, we've, uh, we've looking at amending land uses and as Shaheen shared, you know, breaking down those walls and, and looking at what um, what the potential for these buildings looks like. Um, we have a, you know, we could, I'd say on the, if you look at governments and you look at the, the scorecard across the board, um, we're a safe community, you know, great first responders. Um, we have uh, amenities, we have, you know, we're a tree city of USA, we have parks, we have, you go down the list of all the things that make a great community. Um, but we also have our own culture and, and that's what we're really trying to pull out right now um, is it's there um, in the last probably 20, 25 years as we started to really kind of grew a little fast, um, started to dissipate a little bit, but we're, we're working to bring it back and Shaheen's helping us do that. So I guess to, to fully answer your question, um, we're, uh, we strategize our development in that we're, we're not static and we're just continuing to, to look at future next generation breaking breaking down those walls um, and trying to look at, uh, at how we can be innovative that's great well you're doing something right because Shaheen's a pretty cool guy to be working with on, on that kind of stuff so <laughs> it's it's been a lot of fun let me tell you that yeah, absolutely uh, Rob um, can you tell us a little bit about how the technology that you're developing uh, contributes to understanding community context and potential from like a land use and economic development and community de community development perspective? Sure, you bet. So I think the key is vision. Um, we typically think of vision as an abstraction, like a visioning exercise or something like that. Uh, but the best vision is one that we can literally see, like whether that's in the mind's eye or see on paper. Visualization uh, of our community, of what our communities might look like in the future, is really critical for helping decision makers and stakeholders and the public literally see the future. Uh, of course, we can't predict the future with certainty as COVID-19 and so many other issues make plainly clear, but we can shape the future and visioning around what that looks like is very powerful. To uh, maybe bring in a couple cliches, 
seeing is believing, uh, or a picture is worth a thousand words. Both of these really speak to the power of visualization to help influence how we perceive the world. And how we perceive the world, of course, is how we ultimately end up building it. Um, but visualization doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it, it can't just be a bunch of pretty pictures. It still relies on the power of spatial analysis to really understand a place and to see the patterns of urban life and development that might not be evident otherwise. Um, so these analyses can also be visualized. And when uh, shown on a base map or a digital twin, as it's sometimes called, that is a, a, a sort of a realistic view of your community in 3D, um, these analyses are grounded in a sense of place, making them more real to us. Uh, and in particular, and this is really my area of interest, is looking at systems that allow us to understand uh, through 3D graphics. Um, typically, the production of compelling 3D graphics has been very expensive, uh, and it was, a, it was really relegated to the end when trying to sell a project or a plan, when, uh, when most of the decisions or maybe all of the decisions have already been made. But the real power of, the, of visualization and, in, and using these kinds of tools happens when we infuse a graphic understanding of our communities all throughout the process of designing these alternative futures. Um, this is a little hard to convey verbally without some kinds of visuals, but think of it kind of like um, the, the game SimCity, which you mentioned earlier, uh, but for real world planning. And uh, so I think that um, GIS or Geos uh, Geographic Information Systems Technology has been part of how we design and build cities for more than 40 years, but there's a real confluence of new technology that's enabling a lot of new uh, capabilities for us. And uh, that's what we're really excited to help bring to the development community and to the planning community. Great, thanks Ron. So we're gonna move to the more rapid fire um, part of the uh, uh, half hour here. Um, and Shaheen, I'm gonna start with you and put you on the spot a little bit. I know this might be like asking, uh, what is your favorite child? Uh, but which development project are you most proud of and why? Oh my, um, you know, honestly, I, obviously we, the, the proof is in the pudding. We have never sold a project in the history of our company in the last 30 years. I probably should have, but <laughs> we didn't. And uh, so I think these projects for us really are really less about, let's just develop it and put a cap rate on it and flip it. and. Uh, we stay within those communities. We continue to grow within those communities. I think we we take a larger picture. As in, for example, we're working in Long Beach and we're working on 52 lots. It's literally, you know, a couple plus city blocks. Uh, we have the opportunity to do that in Anaheim. We're hoping that we can have all of this materialize in, in Corona. We're working on a really, really an exciting project. It's sort of Burning Man meets retail down in San Marcos. Um, and that's, that's, I mean, that's been really fun just because it's sort of ahead of all the other projects right now in terms of new developments. And we're uh, actually into sort of uh, design and, you know, what this thing's going to look like. So that's been really exciting for me. But the excitement is really the opportunity of, of, of trying to capture what people want in the future. You know, I, I think that's, Honestly, where, you know, people like Steve Jobs were so good at, you know, he wasn't necessarily the best engineer. I mean, he, he wasn't even that great technical guy. He was obviously surrounded by lots of talent, but he just had this magic of, you know, figuring what people want, or, you know, I think Elon Musk is a little bit of that these days, you know? So that's the fun part, you know? Um, I mean, honestly, the, the biggest thing that I really want to share here with the group is, which is an interesting thing that's going on. You know, I, I keep going back to this COVID-19 because we're so thick into it. And again, as operators, because we have our own restaurants and retail and so forth. Um, you've probably heard me say in the past, like our biggest challenge here in the state of California, and I'm a total environmentalist. We built the first green retail center in the country. It was before green was a vocabulary, but it has been our policies. You know, I think what one of the things that's the challenge for me at my age is it takes so long to get entitlement. Uh, what used to take two years takes five plus years. Um, we're working with policies that were written in the 70s and 80s and we're trying to kind of conform with these policies and look how much this is, this is before we even had iPhones and look how much everybody's world has changed. So we're, you know, we're looking at developments with, again, without 
necessarily using the old rules. And, and the only way we can accomplish that is just, you know, a really serious partnership with cities. Um, it's very difficult to go and I mean, look, most developers are in it, you know, you want to build it, you want to flip it, you want to move on to the next project, you know, yeah. but I think this is different. You know, I think if we're talking about community building and working with local operators, so these are not national uh, operators that you just go to ICSC and sign up, you know, um, so you really have to stay on, you have to work with them on a weekly, daily basis. Um, it's a different commitment. Um, and so I, I think really what's happened again during this COVID is like some of the rules have been lax and, and it's been really exciting for us. I'll give you an example. We turned our parking lots into drive-ins because we couldn't, our restaurants were closed or takeout only. So you could actually, it's kind of like the 60s and 70s when I was, when I grew up, we all went to drive-in. So families pull up in their trucks, they open the back van, they set up chairs, you know, they got the kids and the dog and they order food that gets delivered to the cars. And uh, we have live concert and we show movies and you know, it's packed. It's unbelievable how people, there's no way we could have done that if the cities hadn't laxed the parking rules and they did i hope it continues to stay that way we've taken our park and turned it into dining space you know so we these picnic areas and you know we we have the six foot distancing and so forth but in the past everything had to be inside i mean here we are in the state of california we we all live here because of the weather and you know it's you have to always struggle and fight for outdoor patio seating and that's always like that's one that just drives me bananas, you know, and, and it's all about parking and parking and parking. And, you know, and I think the world has just evolved and these rules have sort of stayed. So I'm excited about any of the developments to answer your question in, in the long format that give us the opportunity to use some new rules and not necessarily build these sort of black boxes that have been built over the last 30, 40 years. I mean, I think for us to get different product, we, we just need some flexibility uh, and have some trust in people that actually see the future and not necessarily build things that we've done in the past. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna have one last question, maybe 30 seconds or less from each of you about what is your vision for how we kind of rethink the future of retail in our, um, in our urban environments here in Southern California? So maybe Ryan, you could, you could start with that. Yeah. Um quickly uh, just rethinking what what's the next uh, what's the next five ten years look like 20 years look like um, it's, uh, it's I think Shane's spot on we wouldn't be partnering with them if we didn't believe, believe it um, it's going to be about uh, this next generation wanting to know and, and seeing feeling um, evoking all the emotions and everything behind the product uh, I, I see a lot of these chains yet not Transitioning, I won't say they will die out, but it's going to be retail development is going to definitely evolve into more of these maker type spaces. Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Rob? Yeah, well, we know traditional retail is suffering, and we know that intense competition from online and low cost retailers has steadily eroded brick and mortar locations. But at the same time, people still crave that, that experience, right? So um, in my mind, retail uh, now has to have an even greater value proposition than just the in-store experience. And that's where place comes in as a distinguishing factor. And place is something that doesn't happen inside the store. It happens in the spaces around stores um, in, in between buildings. Um, high quality places have a threshold or critical mass that's needed before a place can really emerge as a great place. And so there's always the trick of, um, you know, who goes first and, and how do you, you have catalyst sites that get us towards that critical mass. Um, so I would just, the other piece of that is that uh, given the present need to address housing, especially affordable housing, as well as uh, office performance and, and all these other issues that are all rooted in the uh, urban environment, um, by bringing that together around retail centers or around retail in general, which adds a lot of vitality, um, can be a really synergistic strategy. Um, and I think that's gonna be really critical going forward. Thank you, Rob. And Shaheen, any final thoughts on future of retail? Yes, I'm agreeing. <laughs> I have a few thoughts on that. Okay, so <laughs> I, I think, you know, the, 
it comes down to social. To me, that is really the driving factor. The reality is anything that's non-emotional and, and, and basically necessity, necessity commodity, we're going to buy online. There's really no reason to go get in your car and drive to a grocery store and buy, you know, your toilet paper. You can order online. It's a non-emotional, at least for most of us, <laughs> uh, purchase. <laughs> Uh, so I think our purchases are definitely going to be more emotional. These are situations where we want to have that social conversation and connection with the maker, whether it's the restaurant operator or the chef or whether it's the dressmaker or the leather back pack maker. Uh, we want to have the conversation. And those are what I call emotional projects. And this is the segment that I call this local crafters and micro manufacturing that's important to us. Again, anything else you can buy online, and I think online is gonna to continue to, to grow, obviously, um, but it's it's products with a purpose, you know, it's that's what's gonna drive things. I think this idea of having this interaction and creating the places where people can bump into each other and have, um, have, have a conversation, you know, which goes back to community, I think, it goes back to that. And, you know, I think a clear, you know, old school example of that is, you know, would you rather buy your uh, tomatoes at Vaughn's where it's wrapped in some fake ceramic, you know, and, or would you rather have, buy it from your local farmer who talks to you about the tomato season and it's these beautiful heirloom, luffy looking tomatoes where they taste absolutely delicious. And then at that point, you, it doesn't really matter, you know, what it costs, you know? Or you can order them on Amazon Prime and they'll deliver it to your house. So I think you can see one has is totally about the local experience and bumping into, uh, into people and having a conversation with a grower. And to me, that has huge value. And I think most of us are, you know, sort of headed towards that type of a uh, uh, relationship with our makers, you know, again, whether it's a restaurant or it's your local farmers or if it's your local coffee maker, you know, it could be. So... For me, it's, you know that that's starting to have a lot more, a lot more clarity. You know, at the end of the day, and I think this is also, you know, when people ask what's going to happen to retail after COVID nineteen, we're all hardwired to be social. Uh, we, we, you know, people are not going to stay at home and order food for the rest of their lives. I mean, it's just it's not sustainable. You know, I just I've been getting out myself. I just drove up to Big Sur just to get away, Every, everything is packed, you know? I mean, the restaurants and people wanna be back out again, people wanna socialize again. Of course, you know, many are wearing masks and being very cautious, which they should be, but it just shows that, you know, people, we can't keep people locked down. So the social aspect of this is really the driver for me. That's fantastic. What a great optimistic um, way to conclude our discussion here today. I wanna to really thank so much, Rob, Ryan, and Shaheen. And thank you all viewers for, um, uh, you know, watching this and uh, we'll uh, conclude there. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Rachel Singh with WRCOG. One last time for today. Um, as a reminder, for those who would like to submit a question, be sure to go to slido.com or scan the QR code at the bottom of the screen to type in and type in the code forward three to submit a question for our panel today. Um, if by chance we do not get to your question in the time that we have for our panel, um, we will be archiving them and reaching out to the speakers individually um, to provide a written response and we'll distribute that after the webinar. Um, but thank you, um, place panel for participating today in our Future Forward broadcast. We actually have a question um, kicking off the conversation from someone in our live audience, and it says, what do you think of the City of Riverside's concept to create an innovation district? Are these concepts important to developers or more of a marketing as asset to cities? So Ryan, do you think you could start us off by answering this question? Thanks, Rachel. Um, I've been following Riverside. I'm, I'm excited to see what they're doing there. They're doing a lot of great things with their innovation district. You know, a couple of years ago, they landed uh, CARB California Air Resource Board in connection with uh, UC Riverside. So two great assets in that community. And I know they're working, they've done a pretty good job with developing their downtown. It keeps expanding. So to be able to have that synergy and going from the UC down to uh, down to downtown, um, really excited. They're, they're really working to cluster their, their technology businesses there. I know they're working on some programs and some uh, incentives to try to attract more so i'm on board with it i know there's been some questions of is it going to work and is it just a marketing plan um 
And we've done something similar here and tried to attract aerospace companies and it's been successful for us. Um, and uh, I would I would have to say it's not a marketing plan and uh, it's gonna take a little bit of time to develop and but uh, there's a vision there and, and from an economic development standpoint I to uh, agree they're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. Shaheen, from a developer's perspective, what, what do you what is your take on Riverside's innovation district? Well, I think whenever the opportunity to bring like-minded people or like-minded uh, creativity together, there is always this intrinsic value that happens. I mean, it's quite honestly what we do with our products. It doesn't necessarily have to be limited to tech, but from what I understand, I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. Um, I, I think what's gonna, what would make it really important though and what would really create value is the opportunity within the zoning and the opportunity within the village, let's call it, there are places that's gonna promote people bumping to each other and exchange creativity. I also think uh, that if there is the opportunity to add amenities and services, you know, um, whether it's the Great Organic Cafe or a place that people can gather in, in a park and have conversation, I think that always sort of that social equity that it, um, it, it, it can present, I think that'll have tremendous value. Mm -hmm. Wallace, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, briefly, you know, I think supporting innovation is really crucial for Southern California's future and for all, you know, Inland Empire, Orange County, LA County. Um, I'm always, you know, we don't have a ton of economic development tools in California like some other states do. So always sort of exploring new ones and developing new ones, um, I think is, is top of mind for me. And then finally, I think, you know, our tech community, uh, you know, has so many good multiplier effects and so many, uh, creates so many good paying jobs, just sh sort of showing them the love of developing something like that is really crucial for signaling that a city is open for, you know, uh, the tech community to, uh, to, co to come on in. Mm -hmm. I think it's as much as an economic development driver, it is a marketing play to your point, what you just said, Wallace, it's kind of the both um, dynamic. So Shaheen, I did want to ask, you said um, during the panel discussion how each community has its own culture. You also said that everyone is cool, which um, my, <laughs> what I thought was pretty funny. Um, but how does a city identify or reconnect with their culture? And how do you translate that into an actual space? Well, again, I'm sort of convinced and committed to this. I, you know, particularly the cities within Riverside or Orange County. I mean, some of these cities are hundreds plus years old and considering the country is only, you know, 300 years old. I mean, I think it's the history we have. Um, I do think it takes a little bit of archeology. span uh, Every city has its own story. Every, every city has citizens that have sort of been committed to the area and there's a generation of people that live there. To be honest, it just reminds me a little bit of the Midwest. You know, I think most of us in California move around a lot. You know, I grew up uh, in Michigan, and uh, you know, the people that I went to to high school with, they're still in the same house. You know, maybe they live in their parents' house after their parents have retired or moved on. So I think this sense of um, culture really comes through history and the people that have lived there. Uh, I think every community has a story and. The thing that we really look for is we look for, we call it the 4C process. So it's, it's sort of the, the, the four legs on a, on a table or on a chair for, 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 to get the stability. And so obviously we tap into the community and again, every city we find that there's a, has some um, uh, resemblance or some uh, great strength of community. Uh, as we talked about culture, you know, I think every city has culture and some of it has just been lost just through over time um, and sort of the shift of demographics and social graphics, but the culture is still there. Um, I also think that the opportunity for each city to do, to have its own commerce is very important. I think we're all finding that we really like to do things in our neighborhoods as opposed to, you know, living in one place and going somewhere else to spend our money for entertainment or, or, or education or what have you. So this idea of having that balance. And the, the fourth C for me is consciousness. Uh, and that really can mean a lot of different things. But, you know, for me, it, it's, you know, this idea that you can just go plock in a retail center or a shopping center or any kind of a project in the middle of, you know, somebody's hometown or somebody's community. I think those days are over. You know, I think that 
most of these communities that I'm aware of. Uh, I think the, the locals want to co-author uh, mm -hmm. the project, whatever it might be, and just be getting them involved, uh, I think does a lot, you know, for the most part, when you're complete with the project, if they're co-authoring it, they're your customers and they're the ones that are going to support it. So I think you're basically building, you're building for them, you know, you're building for mm -hmm. the community. So again, for us, the four C's, community, culture, consciousness, and commerce, it's sort of the, you know, the, the platform that, that we look for. Definitely. Ryan, do you have anything to add given your experience in helping create these almost community reflective spaces for the city of Corona? Yep. Well, as you know, we're, we're right in the midst of creating that, that space right now and partnering with Shaheen. Um, but every street, you know, us being an older town, let's be cross, uh, every street, every building has character and there's a story behind it. And that's one of the things we heard a lot of clear from our community was, um, you know, we're, we're, we're some um, close to historic buildings here, some older buildings and there's character to them. Everybody remembers what they were like when they first opened up and as a thriving downtown and where we were at today. And Shaheen came in and said, no, I can, I can work with this. It doesn't need to be completely scraped. We can, we can still cherish the tree there and, uh, and work with it and still develop around and just bring that building to, to you know, the second phase of its life. And same thing with every street corner, every community. Um, you have to just go in there and understand. And that's one of the first things she came out two or three times and met with us and walked the community and went to, uh, just drove the community with his staff and wanted to understand what it is because what works here isn't going to work in every city in Orange County or, mm -hmm. or LA. Um, so you just really got to understand it. And like Shaheen said, everyone wants to go off of that. I think that's a great way of saying it is how do you get the community involved and, and understand their needs and wants really. Mm -hmm. When they don't want, they're not going to support it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of um, involvement and ownership right now in the process of placemaking, it sounds like. So, Rob, I actually have a question for you from more of a technical standpoint. Um, how does placemaking change with COVID-19? So to flesh that out a little bit more, I we do see how COVID-19 has impact impacted many facets and we've experienced new mandates like six feet of distance, mask wearing, um, but from a planning perspective, do you think that there will be systematically different strategies implemented, um, like perhaps permanent hand sanitizing stations, kind of like how we have um, permanent um, like drinking fountains, or maybe a, more of an emphasis on outdoor space. So I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. Yeah, I, I think that the reason that we're interested in places that were made with placemaking in mind is because they feel good and they, we, we respond to them, whether it's the authenticity or the sense of enclosure or just the ability to be around other people. And what's happened with COVID is that now a lot of people are really, really suffering from lack of social contact and all of that. So I think placemaking will play an even more important role in the future. And I think, like you said, placing some emphasis, especially in sunny California, on outdoor spaces uh, where that's very practical is mm -hmm. definitely a way to go. Uh, and then of course, there's some different logistics involved, as you mentioned. Um, I like the Shaheen's C uh, four C's. I just came up with three S's, spacing, <laughs> screening, and sanitizer. <laughs> um, don't quote me on that. And, uh, uh, and I think those are all gonna be important, but I think that those are more tactical rather than, than um, physical interventions that need to happen in, in the built environment. But just to come back to the importance of, of place and place making, I think that you know, there's, there will be a time when we emerge from this crisis. We don't know if it's going to be a few months or a few years. Um, we also don't know if there will be another type of virus that could come up at some point in the future. And so it, it's well advised that we're prepared for that. And thinking about how our physical spaces are designed is certainly a part of that. But I don't think that we need to design our spaces completely with that lens. Um, the good news is, is that high quality placemaking, in my opinion, already reflects some of that um, capability to keep people safe. Mm -hmm. So I would say, let's just keep rolling with this idea that um, placemaking is important and let's try to make the best places we can. Mm -hmm, definitely. I, to your point, COVID-19 really has highlighted the fact that as humans, we crave that social interaction and that is reflective of the types of places that we do create. Um, so Wallace, as um, an Orange County guy, can you sh maybe share some best practices of from the OC that you've seen really take place to make OC who it is today, um, a hub for businesses? What, what kind of lessons learned can we have here in the Inland Empire? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to follow up on four C's and three <laughs> S's with one D, I guess, which is, you know, we've long known that diversity is a real strength in Orange County and it's allowed our economy to grow. We're not just one thing. We're, you know, all the way from medical device uh, industry to surfwear and skate and sunglasses to you know, tourism, world-class tourism. Um, our population is increasingly diverse. That's a real strength. And I think one of the um, things that Shaheen has brought to the table is really important. You know, we have 34 separate cities and then the unincorporated part of the county. And probably, you know, 30 years ago, it was very homogenous. Um, every, every place kind of looked the same in Orange County. And I think we got kind of a wrap in terms of that. But I think what Shaheen brought is that each of those 34 cities is a distinct uh, place. And that diversity and building upon, you know, the strengths and the history of the community has allowed us to create this really diverse set of retail spaces, diverse industry, diverse kind of building types, depending on whether you're on the coast or you know, in Fullerton. Um, so I think that that, to me, that's what I, I've really come to understand is sort of Orange County's strength now is those 34 separate visions about what this city can be mm. and what we can build on here and create a, you know, a brighter future. Mm -hmm. That goes exactly to what Shaheem was saying during the discussion of localization versus homogenization and how that's really been used in leverage in Orange County in so many ways, to your point. So Ryan, kind of shifting perspective a little bit, but from a city, how do you empower people to be involved and take ownership in the process of creating a place that they can and are proud of? Thanks, Rachel. Um, that's always, it's always arguably a challenging with any project, with any development um, coming forward. But it's really, like Shaheen said, everyone wants to to co-develop co that or, be, or feel uh, like they have a say in it, uh, be able to share that. Um, in particular, here in Corona, we do very transparent. Uh, we start uh, projects at, uh, as soon as it comes in. We, uh, as soon as we have a better idea of what the project's going to be, we take it to a committee level uh, just to share it publicly. It's open for discussion. We continue that process through, uh, all the way through planning commissions council we're constantly meeting with our stakeholders so you got to continue to meet with every single stakeholder there whether it's community members developers local residents people from even out, outside the organization or outside of the city who um, want to want to under, better understand the process so um, really i guess the best way to put it is continually um, being transparent and just uh, open being open to discussion you know if there's some cities mm -hmm. out there who aren't always uh, open to that or have that conversation but from a staff level and from a uh, all the way through our elected officials, we've always been very open to to sitting down and having that conversation, and saying what what are your ideas, and we've always kind of taken that approach that uh, we don't know, always necessarily know uh, have, the, have the best answer to every solution. Let's let's take it in, let's look at it from a three hundred and sixty degree, and uh, look at the long term vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then at, kind of adding on to that too, and um, this will probably be our last question, just in the in the sake of, for the sake of time. But how do you balance NIMBY the NIMBY sense of mentality, NIMBY meaning not in my backyard, with developments that enhance the overall quality of life for residents? There's always going to be that uh, those certain residents who don't always want to maybe adapt to change or or, or uh, see the bigger bigger picture. Um, you know, for instance, we're we're doing some projects in our downtown, and there's a lot of people who remember the downtown and want to don't really want to see that change. Mm -hmm. um, many do, and many don't. But uh, it's really just um, involving them and sitting down with them and understanding what that what that process. So they hear development, and oftentimes one thing we found is there's often a lot of rumors about what's being developed on that project. We had a, a project come forward uh, that was a new medical development building with some historic architecture to it, um, but there's discussions that it was a multifamily project. And, spread very quickly so it's also um, taking an advantage of all those media streams and um, and ways to communicate with the public so that's something we've done uh, we, we're we follow the city of Corona, you'll find out arguably we put out more messaging than, than say most of our surrounding communities and put a bit big emphasis on being able to share facts and what's truly going on mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of correspond to that Mm -hmm, definitely. The the consistent stream of information, I'm sure, really helps clear the air or maybe just even the expectations of what's happening in the city. So I'm sure that's so helpful. Yeah. Um, well, with that, that's, oh, did you have something to add? So please go ahead. 
I was just going to say at the end of the day, it always comes down to communication and being open to communication that can, you can resolve 95% of your problems. If you're just open to sitting down, communicating, uh, taking that meeting or that phone call. Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for being a part of our Future Forward broadcast today, and thank you for your insightful comments. Um, we will now be concluding this portion of our live Q&A portion and moving into some oh, close, closing remarks. Sorry. So, Michelle, go ahead and take it away.